salve María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre Jesús. The advent of Spanish colonial rule on Cuba at the beginning of the 16th century was accompanied by an equally important influx of religious congregations. The Dominican and Franciscan missionaries soon established schools and hospitals, as well as a number of churches. By 1728, Havana had a Catholic university and 40 years later, a seminary. Subsequent centuries saw the authority of the church grow to where the Cuban elite grew concerned about the church's political influence. Cuba's regime under president-elect Fulgencio Batista responded by introducing secular policies and adapting the country's constitution to limit the church's power. Notwithstanding these changes, the church still enjoyed popular authority and a certain degree of religious freedom. At one time, the Catholic Church was the only church on Cuba, the only one with its own religious and educational institutions, a great promoter of cultural and educational development throughout the island. That is how and why the Catholic faith became rooted in our culture, in our genuine Cuban culture. Despite the restrictions, Cuba experienced a period of religious renewal in 1959 with the island-wide pilgrimage of the statue of Our Blessed Lady of El Cobre. Batista took part in all the religious ceremonies, including the erection of a 33-meter statue of Christ as a sign of unity between state and church. This, however, did not reflect the church hierarchy's attitude towards Batista because of his anti-Catholic stance. The figurine of Our Lady of El Cobre arrived in Havana on the day that the oppressive Batista regime was overthrown by Fidel Castro. Consequently, the church saw the revolution as a gift from Providence. The Catholic hierarchy only set the alarm bells ringing once the execution of the first so-called war criminals, in fact, opponents of the revolution began and the first steps towards nationalizing land and school reform were taken. The church officially condemned communism for the first time in 1960. Castro's response was to withhold church access to the mass media. A year later, with the revolution having officially adopted Marxist doctrine, a wave of religious expulsions began, forcing all foreign monks and priests to leave Cuba. Finally, all church schools and hospitals were nationalized and acute repressions of the faithful began. I became a qualified teacher in 1964, but could only practice my profession for four years, as in 1968 I was dismissed for declaring that I was a practicing Catholic. Many other teachers were thrown out with me. Before 1959, the church blossomed and its spiritual life was very rich. After 59, the opposite happened. Places of worship became empty, and the only people that attended in large numbers were what we called grey hairs, old people. That was the result of the hostile attitude towards the faith that we were experiencing. We were subjected to political pressures. The young were told that if they attended church, they would not be able to continue their studies, whilst workers were informed that attendance could damage their job prospects. Fear was ever-present.
Repressions ranged from subtle coercion to outright destruction. Hundreds of churches were symbolically ruined or desecrated, with many a church property converted to non-religious purposes. There were chapels in some villages that were lost. They were taken over for other purposes, educational, medical, and sometimes they even became dance halls, and we can't get them returned. With the triumphs of the 1959 revolution, our commandante took away our faith and closed the gates of our churches. This was a very beautiful church. The first wedding was celebrated here in 1947, and the last on December the 13th, 1959. Today there is a terrible sadness and great poverty. But I believe that once this church is rebuilt, happiness will, as before, once again return to our community. We have a great need for a church. This was a Catholic community, and we want to see our church once again, for we are convinced that we have faith and believe that happiness will return and poverty will cease to trouble us so. The church, as the only independent voice with popular authority more than ever, presents the greatest threat to Castro's regime. Consequently, the policy of destroying places of worship has been augmented by a concerted effort to limit the church's pastoral work. Foreign missionaries have great difficulty obtaining visas and access to the country is severely limited. Contacts with the religious communities and seminaries are controlled and the number of seminarians restricted. The result is a church frustrated and unable to respond to great pastoral needs. I haven't created new parishes because under the present circumstances, that is not possible. Parishes stretch over large areas with many chapels served by one priest. Some of these churches that we call chapels stand in towns with populations from 15 to 20,000 people. This number of priests is clearly insufficient for such large populations. Because the church is in such a terrible state of repair, catechism classes take place here every Sunday at 9 a.m. Children and adults take part, and on every last Wednesday of the month, Holy Mass is celebrated here, under the open sky, and we must be satisfied with that. Everything is changing. People have great faith and they want their children to be baptised. Recently there were 15 baptisms celebrated by Father Albert. Parents ask me every day, when will they come to baptise again? They want to educate their children, to have them submit to God, to become better educated every day. Today the children know nothing. They don't know what Christmas is or anything about the Three Kings. They receive no toys, they know nothing. In parallel with attacks on the Catholic Church, there has been a return to so-called traditional religions on Cuba, religions deeply rooted in African voodoo customs. Historically, these traditional religions have intertwined and fused with elements of the Catholic faith, the resulting confusion called syncretism. A variety of ethnic groups immigrated, almost 20 different groups, and they all brought their religious beliefs with them. Later, these Africans mixed themselves with the church. Why? Because the colonial power forbade them to practice their own religion. This was the time on Cuba that black slaves applied en masse to be baptized, not because of their belief in baptism, but rather to be able to continue practicing their own religion. That was the beginning of syncretism on Cuba. It is like a religion, Our Lady of Cobre. This is a saint that we have in our religion, that we worship here. We light a candle or a cigar, and this is so-called Elegua. We usually say that he is the Lord of the ways, that he opens our ways. He opens your way, he gives you good luck, he helps you. We give